So Lord God, let the words of Your Holy Scriptures renew our minds, renew our hearts, our lives, and our actions, Father. Give us the courage to yield all parts of who we are to You today. Amen. You may take your seats. <laughs> In my time as a, as a pastor, I've been fascinated how many times people who have been long-standing members of a church for many, many years have been part of it, and yet they still wonder if they're really Christians or not. They, they, they aren't sure about their salvation. And while there isn't like some exact litmus test that we can take, you know, and it's like a pregnancy test, if it comes out with two lines, you're Christian, one line, you're not, you know, or anything like that. But what we, what we can do is look at how or how who he is has changed our lives. When a woman has a newborn child, it radically changes her life, right? Her sleep schedule is destroyed completely. That child, now, that child's needs take priority over almost anything else going on in their life. And it radically changes them forever. They will forever, as long as that child's alive, be thinking about that child, right? When they move out of the house, do we stop thinking about them? Do we stop praying for them? No, because they're always part now of, as, of who we are. When you have yielded your life to Jesus Christ and truly made Him Lord, there, are gonna, there might be little moments and blips in, 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 the, in your life, but for the most part, His desires more and more become your desires. What He wants from you becomes more important than what we want for ourselves. And it makes us stand out radically different, at least it should, from those who are not part of His kingdom because it's natural, if, you're, if they're not part of His kingdom, to think more selfishly and narcissistically. It's just how we're, we're made, how we're wired. But it's only our love for God that can break that off. And so we have this parable this morning about the talents. And what's interesting is the word talent has had a lot of different meanings throughout the scriptures and throughout its history, but the word talent started off by simply meaning a unit of weight, about 75 pounds. It then shifted its meaning to mean a unit of money. But in the end, as Jesus presents it here, it represents the very core of everything you and I are. And so to read the parable of the talents and think it's just about giving what we should in the offering plate strongly weakens the meaning behind the passage. And my hope this morning is to show us how every area of our lives can more and more come in line with what God wants us to be and who He wants us to become and how we can honor Him. And so the first part of the Scripture, we see one of them being given five talents, another one given three talents, and another one given one talent. Now, does that mean God shows favoritism to some and not others? Of course it doesn't. Because each of us are required to be faithful with what He gives to us, right? And that's a wonderful thing about God because I never have to compare myself to you. We were talking in the prayer time ahead of time. I said, what's great about God is someone who can't sing real well can be singing worship at the same time as someone who sings really well. And to God, both are beautiful offerings of worship. Amen? We just had a, a, a funeral for a precious, precious lady, Sally, yesterday. And you may not have known, but Sally, in her earlier life in England, she was a high-level dancer who used to go around and kind of go around the country, and she was dancing. And I thought, when we get to heaven, I will dance as well as Sally does. Isn't that great? Because to God, it's all just an offering. I said, when we get there. Now is not that, it would not be that time. But so we have to look at, when God gives us certain things, we are now responsible to use it for His honor. But never feel like we have to compare what we're doing to someone else. Because the moment I start trying to serve God the way Greg or the way Dottie serves God, I then stop being faithful to Him, and I'm trying to be faithful to some concept of what I think I should be doing. Did everybody follow that? I thought it was pretty good, so I hope you got it. I don't think I can say it again. So, all right. First thing we're going to look at is our natural abilities. Now, 
This is God. For those of you that know the scriptures and you know the story of how Saul used to be a persecutor of the church and then met Jesus Christ along the road and then all of a sudden his life was radically changed and became one of the most dynamic men of God to walk the earth. That was Saul's story. But let me ask you a few things. For those of you that know the story of Saul and Paul, I don't want to go all into it, but let me just ask you some quick questions. Was Saul or Paul like the transition to Paul, which of those was he a passionate, motivating man? Both, right? One, he did it for the Jews. One, then he did it for the Lord. Which of the two, Saul or Paul, was he highly intellectual? Oh, both. Again, boy, this quiz is pretty easy. Which one was he confrontational? I thought I might get you on that one. So, all right. And the final one, which one... Was he spiritually focused? I thought I'd get him on that one, but no, on both. And you're saying, well, what's your point, Matt? My point is that each of us have gifts, abilities. You know, have you taken those Myers-Briggs tests to kind of see how we, we come out? We're wired certain ways, and God created you that way. And just because you didn't realize it, that we all became Christians at different points in life. I became when I was 16. But who I was before I was 16... My par char characteristics, my personality, it didn't change right, you know, when I became a Christian. And so God has given each of us gifts and talents, mindsets, the way we approach things, natural abilities, and he wants those talents to be used for him. We think, but the, no, we didn't use them for him. We were not in the kingdom, but now we use them for him. Some of you have a great sense of humor. Use it for God. Some of you are great encouragers. And you always have been. You just had a desire to help people along their walk in life. Use that for God. Some of you are athletic. Use it for God. Can I tell you, that, that was one of my great traits that I had when I was a youth pastor in Indiana. Is We were in this little country town where all the guys were like these big athletes and everything else. And because I was athletic, I was able to relate with these guys and play football and basketball and all that other stuff with them. And they were brought in through doing that fun stuff. But through it, they met Jesus Christ. And so God used something as silly as athleticism to be a portal for kids to get to know him. Never underestimate how God has made you. You do not have to be like everyone else. Even pastors. Have you noticed in your life, if you've been in multiple different churches or had different pastors, some pastors are gifted as true chaplain-like shepherds. They're wonderful at walking you along the path. And if you go hear them preach, they're not very good. Okay? Being honest, others can preach up a storm, but then when you ask them to counsel someone, you're like, eh, that may not be your best trait, Pastor. Maybe we, we might want to hire. I, hear, I remember the story of the motivational uh, speaker, John Maxwell, when he was a pastor. He said that uh, that was him. He was a great preacher, and the the that, it wasn't a vestry, but the board of leaders pulled him aside and said, we're going to hire a, a counseling pastor. And he goes, why are you doing that? Because you stink at it. And so, and, they, and he said, you know, they were right. I did. Because we're all gifted differently. Even in our marriages, we see how we're all gifted differently. Use who you are, that talent that God has put in you to honor and serve him. Because you can reach people through who you are that others cannot reach through who they, who they are. Amen? All right, so just take 10 seconds and think about what are those qualities that have always kind of been there in your life that you've noticed about yourself? And start to evaluate those things and ask God to say, how can that be used for your kingdom? And that's the first kind of talent I wanted to talk about. The second one I'm going to go through real quick because I've preached on it before and it really is its own message in itself. But the second one is after you become a believer, he starts to place spiritual gifts in you where the Holy Spirit works through you. Amen? And the problem with our Christian culture is we tend to elevate the teaching and the prof prophetic, prophetic gifts and all these like out front gifts as if they're more important than the other gifts listed, like gifts like administration. I mean, when's the last time you saw somebody say, I have the gift of administration, and I'm so proud of it, and, you know, I'm going to do a conference for all the administrative people, right? No, because it's just a simple gift. You know, being an encourager is a gift of the Spirit, Paul says. Did you realize that? There are all kinds of gifts he places within us, and we must never value one above the other. 
because they all work together as the body of Christ for his glory. And so just real quick, I thought I'd touch on just a couple of them. And he talks, it says, there are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of workings, uh, but the same God works in them all. And the, the result or the expression of the Spirit is for the common good of everyone. Some have a great gift of faith. Have you ever met people who just, I don't know if we call it just a positive attitude, but they just tend to believe for things more than some of us who might be more pessimistic. Do you know what I'm talking about? That's, that's the beginnings of the gift of faith. Be believing something can be accomplished that other people think cannot be accomplished. Now, of course, in the spiritual sense, it's we're believing it so that God's kingdom can move forward. So we have that gift of faith. We have the gift of prophecy, which we, we take away all the, the bells and whistles from the word prophecy. It simply means God working and speaking through us to help others, to give us insight into how to help others. If you have ever come to church and all of a sudden you looked at somebody and God said, you need to go pray for that person. Or, you know, you might want to just go and encourage that person. That's the gift of prophecy working through you. He's speaking to you for the benefit of someone else. That's how 1 Corinthians chapter 14 talks about the gift of prophecy. And so, and just for the record, I'll just throw this out there as a, as a something for you to, to chew on and I'll just pass on. Do you know what gift Paul tells us that we should urgently or urgently urge God to give to us the gift of prophecy. Did you know that? When was the last time any of us said, God, give me the gift of prophecy? We may have said, God, give somebody else the gift of prophecy. Right? Right? But Paul says, pray for it. Pray that you have the ability to hear from the Lord and then act upon it for the benefit of his kingdom. That's all it is. Okay? Amen. All right, so the first one was the natural abilities. The next one is the spiritual gifts that he gives to us, and we have to ask God how those talents can be used for him. Obviously, part of the passage deals with finances and possessions, but not in a way that it's just about what we put in the offering plate. At no part in this scripture does it say, and thou givest thy gifts in thy offering plate and nowhere else. Does your version have that? No, I wouldn't mind that version. That could be a good version for the church. But no, because God wants us thinking bigger. Do you know it is just as holy and good a gift for you to take your wife out for a wonderful dinner, if that's how God tells you to use your money, as it is to put money in the offering plate? Do you understand that? And all the finance team said, ugh. Yeah, no, don't worry, we'll get there. But, but I want you to grasp this. The money we have, the possessions we have, belong to him and are alone to us. Okay? And we tend to put it in this little spiritual kind of nugget and say, and so it's how we give it to the church. That is a facet. And it's a very real facet because it can reveal selfishness in us sometimes. And it's a very important part of how we use our finances. But it has to be beyond that, everybody. Do we get that? That it's what we have, it's what we can offer, it's what we do. If I go through all my Christmas ornaments and I take my favorite Dallas Cowboy ornament and God says, give it to Jamie as a wedding present because she's a Cowboy fan, and I say no, I can put a hundred bucks in the offering plate extra and that's not as good as doing what God told me to do, right? I was going to bring it and then I forgot, so tough break. And so... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe when they get unpacked this week. <clears throat> but I don't mean to o overemphasize, but I want us thinking bigger than just I put my money in the offering and now my work is done on how to handle my possessions. Everything we have is a gift from God. And how we use it is meant to bless and honor Him in whatever form that would be. And so we need to use our possessions that way. In fact, an interesting one that I, I, I don't think we can fully relate to, in fact, I know we can't fully relate to, but I, we can get the concept behind it, is the book Philemon. Has anybody ever read the book Philemon? It will take you all of about 60 seconds. It's one chapter, okay? The whole chapter is about a man named Philemon. Paul writes to him because Philemon's servant had left him, took off, got out of there. And Paul came across him wherever he was ministering. And this, this, this servant named Onesimus, he was with Paul. He became a Christian. And Paul said, you need to go back to the one you were serving. But he sent him back with a letter to his friend Philemon. And the letter is so great. Because tell me this isn't the Apostle Paul. He's like, I'm sending back your servant to you. 
please know that he has been of great value to me. And I'm asking you that he could come and be part of my ministry team. You do what you think is right, but remember, you owe your salvation to me. That's not, isn't that how Paul writes? And so you know, it's kind of leading, but in other words, he's saying, this is something that, is, and I'm not, this is something that was in your possession, this person, and I'm asking you to release him to be part of gospel ministry. And Paul, and he does. And we read in church history that Omnisimus actually became the bishop. I apologize, I forget where it's at. But he became a bishop of one of the churches in one of the areas. And so what we have has to be his. Because that's who it truly is. Amen? We hanging in? Okay, everybody doing good? Stretch out? All right. Last one for this morning. The natural abilities are, his, are talents we give to him. Spiritual gifts are talents we give to him. Our wealth, our possessions, those are things we give to him. And then the final part is our acts of service. And I think these are the most fun. Because God is such a creative God. He can use each of us for different types of acts of service. I mean, if I gave you 10 minutes to think of all the ways that you have, have done things that served others over the past month, you, I'm sure every one of us in here could come up with some type of list. Just a few that I thought about that I knew about is I remember back at my old church in Indiana, we had a rather large youth group, and we had a couple men who, who, who would tag team in a, in a van. They was, remember those big 15-passenger vans that were like buses? That's the kind we had there. And they would drive them all around, and they would pick up all the kids for our youth ministry, the kids whose families couldn't bring them or didn't care about bringing them. And so we would have an extra 30 to 40 kids that would come every night just because these men every week we're willing to drive there, give up their time and their energy to pick up these kids. You think God isn't going to call that a great way to honor him? That they're not going to share in the blessings of those kids who came to know Christ because of it? Just as much as the preacher or the band or anybody else. Another one I thought of came to me as I stood here because this pulpit, when I first got here, your previous pastor thought that this was more than adequate for a pulpit. I would break this thing in half if I was using this. It even rings. What good is that? My goodness. It's a nice little lectern and all that. But I said, you know, I really need to find a pulpit. And I remember talking to Greg and so forth. And then all of a sudden, Henry shows up with a gifting that God has placed in him. I don't know how, when you started, brother, but I know you've been doing it for a long, long time. And he created this beautiful monstrosity. I mean that in the most positive way of a pulpit that I can't break. It's just great. And he used his gift gift to serve this church and gave us a pulpit that is far more beautiful than anything I would have imagined we were going to get. We were looking at those cheesy fiberglass stuff. Remember that stuff? And he comes and brings this beauty. So that's just another way. Now, is that way the same as driving people to a, a youth group? Radically different, right? But the same purpose. The same use of your abilities for service. And I, I won't take long on all of these, but I thought about those who went out and cleaned our memorial garden. I'm not going to put names to all these because I didn't ask everybody if I could use their names. So, But people went out and cleaned our memorial garden before that service. I don't know if you looked at that garden about two, three weeks before we had our service there the other week. No, 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 no. It was in disarray. Is that a good way to put it? Disarray. And these people took their time and they went out and they pulled weeds they yanked up things, they moved things, they, they got things so it looked beautiful as we had our service outside. They gave of their service to the Lord. The people who are, are power washing the church for us, I don't know if you know, a number of people have done it before, but the Spanish church that meets here on Sunday nights, the pastor said, well, I know we can't pay you to be here, but can I power wash the church before Advent? And I said, no. And of course I said yes. Why not? I'm like, please, brother, go right ahead. Power wash the church. And so sometime before the next few weeks, he's going to come. He's going to power wash the whole outside of the church and get it ready for Advent. And then there's the changing of the sign every week, which can be a pain, but it's wonderfully done. There's the, I came in this past week and there were people fixing the bells so that they sound beautiful for us when they play on Christmas Eve. Amen? They just, all these different ways, even, even the very stole I'm wearing, Joanne McCreary felt led by the Lord to sew together and make for me. And so how God, now are any of those giftings exactly the same? Isn't that wonderful? I'm so glad God didn't ask me to sew. It would not turn out well. 
it would not turn out well because he's gifted each one of us different. Some of us have been called to put those boxes together to give them out, to put together the veterans cards to send them out. Some, he asked us to serve, and not just in church, but in so many different ways. When you serve people and you do it out of a love for him, you are laying your talents at his feet and saying, these are yours. And you will not be the last one who was given a talent and he kept it all to himself and he buried it and said, I'm not going to do anything with it. And God reprimanded him for it. It doesn't matter if you're a five-talent person, a three-talent person, because in the end, it's all about how you and I use what he's given to us. And there are seasons in our lives when we can do more for people. Some of us, our talent is working overtime to have extra money for kids for Christmas. That's a gift, isn't it? All of these different ways, friends, if they're done out of love for God and love for others, are a blessing to the Lord that we want to honor with our lives. And I just have one closing point that pulls it all together for us. Oh, one quick thing. Do you know in the Bible it says you will receive a blessing for giving a man of God, a, cu- a bottle of water. Well, the word's cup, but bottle of water. That's just something to... Uh, now, the modern translation of that is Mountain Dew, just so you know. But, but it says you'll be blessed for something as simple as that, as giving a drink of water to somebody who needs it. And so God shows us how to be faithful. Now, in the very end, this is the biggest part about the way we use all of these things I talk to you about, is that we give them and release them. That's the hardest part. It says if somebody came and said, I heard you're thinking of painting the sanctuary. We're, we're not at this point. But just say, well, I heard you thought of, you're thinking of painting the sanctuary. I'd like to pay for all the money for the paint to paint the sanctuary. And that person comes back a month later, and he doesn't like the color we painted it, and he wants his money back. Was he doing it for him, or was he doing it for the Lord? Right? And so when we give something, it's to be given away. And then let God handle what he wants to do with it. If you are being as faithful as you know you can be to honoring God with what you're giving in service or your abilities or your giftings or your finances, then you can leave it at his throne, at his feet, and say amen. But we have to give it in a way that it's released. I'm sure we all have heard stories about people who get mad at the preacher or mad at the music selection. Not you, of course, Mandy. But mad at the music selection, and then they stop giving their money to the church. That shows that they weren't giving it to the Lord in the first place. Because God doesn't change. Amen? They were giving it for what they wanted. And so friends, when we give, when we serve, when we offer what we have to God and to others, we do it with open hands and say, Lord, just bless it however you want to bless it. It is a gift to you. And that, friends, is the story of the talents. Of how God wants us to use every part of who we are and how he's made us to honor him and bless him and expand his kingdom in this area and beyond. Amen? And so, Lord Jesus Christ, I just ask you with all my heart that you continue through your spirit to reveal to us the natural abilities you've given us and how we can use them. That you reveal to us the different spiritual gifts that we may not even know are turning up inside of us and how to use them, Lord. That you give us greater wisdom how to use our wealth and possessions for your great name. And Father, that you also would help us to know how to more effectively serve you. Not so we feel better, but so that we honor you with all that we do. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray these things. Amen and amen. Thank you for hearing that. I invite you to stand.